every so often in life, uh, as you grow older especially, you have these moments where your world has changed. It's interesting as we celebrate Mother's Day, probably the biggest world-changing moment is the day that you become a parent. Your whole world just changes in an instant. There are moments in life where the orientation of your world and the way that you see things goes from one way to another. You start to see things differently. You saw things one way before, and then after that moment, after that circumstance, after that milestone or situation, you now see things a completely different way. A whole new world has opened up to you. We've all had those moments. In fact, I think we're drawn to those moments. We know that life is comprised of these moments of revelation and illumination where we start to see things we hadn't seen before and our world gets turned upside down. It's a human occurrence having that experience of coming into a world and reality that we were previously unaware of. You've had those moments in your life, these moments that our world gets changed. These change your world, whole new world moments, I think we're drawn to. It's reflected in, in superficial ways. If you go scroll Facebook or scroll Instagram, you will see memes where people sarcastically, tongue in cheek, say, this will change your world, referring to some new invention or some food that they post. You know, my world will never be the same after I tried that food or went to that restaurant. Or you'll see a, a meme posted that tells you and shows you, that blows your mind when you realize you've been opening bananas from the wrong side your whole life. You'll never be the same. If you didn't know, you're supposed to open the banana from the bottom, not from the stem. You're welcome. It's an advice that we give. It's, it's, it's in the encouragement or advice we give. Like, I, I love watching a seasoned mother come up to a pregnant mom and say things like, oh, your world's about to change. Right? It's in the stories that we tell, the stories that we love to tell, the movies that we watch. It's these whole new world moments. I mean, you think of Aladdin on this carpet showing up and offering Jasmine the ride of her life as he shows her a whole new world. I won't sing the song, although I could. It's the Truman Show where Jim Carrey comes to find out, oh, this life that I've been living in is actually a soundstage. And there's this whole other reality that I was previously unaware of. It's Neo in the Matrix sitting down in front of Morpheus being offered the red pill where he sees how deep the rabbit hole goes. These moments where we come into the realization that the world I thought I lived in is much more expansive than I previously had understood. Have you ever had a moment where you just, you never saw things the same after that moment? We are acutely aware of these moments of how fast things can change. Where we go from seeing the world one way to stepping into a much different world in an instant. These moments of awakening shape and power our lives, these are the moments that our whole framework and worldview are formed. I tell you this because this helps us understand what we're going to look at today when we see Jesus come on the scene and begin his preaching ministry. We, we actually, this is the first time we hear Jesus address a crowd is in these words. Now, if you're just joining us, we are a church that works our way through the Bible. We've preached through several books in the last decade, and we're on to the Gospel of Matthew. And we've learned over the last handful of weeks that this book is the account of Jesus according to this man named Matthew, who was a first century tax collector, who left everything and followed Jesus firsthand for three years and then lived the rest of his life to tell the story of what he saw and who he believes Jesus is. And we have his account of Jesus in our Bible. So we're looking at that, and Matthew is trying to get us to understand that this Jesus is the fulfillment of all of the promises and prophecies that you find in your Bible. According to Matthew, the whole Bible is about this Jesus. And that Jesus is the true Moses, he's the fulfillment of the Torah, he's the true King David, he is the yes and amen to all the promises of God, he's the wisdom of God found in every proverb, he's the fulfillment of every promise, he's the, he's the artist behind all the Psalms, Jesus is the scripture embodied. And he is the saving plan of God in person. And so Matthew goes out of his way to show us how. 
And we have seen now the genealogy of Jesus. We've seen Jesus be uh, platformed by John the Baptist. And then we saw Jesus led out into the wilderness. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. And now here we find ourselves where Jesus' ministry, what he came to do, begins. Let's read it. Now, how many of you know the first thing that Jesus says is important? Yeah? Yeah? Like, like, this is his thesis statement. This is the cover on the essay. This is the whole central message of Jesus we're going to look at today. And we're just going to spend a few minutes unpacking one sentence that Jesus says. You ready? Here it is. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee, leaving Nazareth. He went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. So there's Matthew tying it right back into the Old Testament. You see, Isaiah was saying this would happen. Here it is. Jesus is the fulfillment. The land, that this is quoting Isaiah 9, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee, of the Gentiles, the people. People living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach. Here is Jesus' central message, his thesis statement, the reason he came in the first place. Here it is. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Repent. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Would you say it with me? Repent, the kingdom of heaven has come near. One more time, everybody. Repent, the kingdom of heaven has come near. That is the central message of Jesus. It's not do better. It's repent, the kingdom of heaven has come near. It's not be a good person. It's repent, the kingdom of heaven has come near. It's not, you know... Change your ways, it's repent, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Repent, the kingdom of heaven has come near. I want to unpack this for a few minutes together today. What does Jesus mean by repent? What does he mean by the kingdom of heaven? And what does he mean by has come near? You have one verse we're going to look at today. Verse 17 of chapter 4. And we're going to study and we're going to try to unpack the central message of Jesus. Because if you don't understand this... You're going to miss the point of all the teachings, the Sermon on the Mount, what Jesus does on the cross. All of it is hinged on and connected to this statement, repent, the kingdom of heaven has come near. And I want to tell you, a lot of us grew up with a too thin, too superficial gospel. This is the gospel of Jesus. This is the good news. This is the invitation. Repent, the kingdom of heaven has come near. So, can we unpack that together? If you have your Bible open, circle the word repent, circle kingdom of heaven, and circle has come near. And we're going to leave here today with an understanding of what Jesus was talking about. So, what does he mean by repent? What does Jesus mean by repent? Now, when you and I read the Bible, and when we hear the words of Jesus, we cannot help but hear through a 21st century Western lens, unless some of you grew up maybe on another part of the world, the bulk of us here at King's Church, Halifax, Charlottetown, wherever you are, you hear through your life experiences and through your Western understanding. So when you hear the word repent, you hear probably something along the lines of what the Oxford Dictionary says repent means. Repent, according to the Oxford Dictionary, means this, to feel or express sincere regret or remorse about wrongdoing and sin. According to the Oxford Dictionary, repenting or repent means to feel guilt or remorse. Sincere guilt or remorse. So the 21st century Western understanding is about repent is the feeling of guilt. It's the feeling of guilt. Now, the biblical word for repent... It does carry the the understanding of wrongdoing. It does carry conviction. It does carry even the idea of guilt. But the biblical word for repent is much more exhaustive. It's much more robust than just feeling guilt. Now, it's interesting to me that in our society where feelings have a preeminent kind of position, that we lean toward the feeling. But biblically speaking, your feelings were not what constituted repentance. 
Biblically speaking, repentance looks like this. To repent in the Bible, let's see if I'm not going to work, here we go. According to the Bible, repentance is not a feeling. Repentance is not just the feeling, it's not feeling guilty, it's not feeling bad, it's not feeling regret. In fact, if you feel regret or you even know that you did something wrong, that does not mean that you have repented. So the Bible has multiple examples of this. You think of the story of Cain and Abel. You know the story in Genesis chapter 4, Cain kills his brother Abel. He very much is aware of what he did, very much aware that he did something wrong, very much living with the reality of that wrongdoing, and yet he never fully, re he never repents. So we, we see that picture. You see Esau later on in Genesis 25 when he steal, when he has his birthright stolen or he trades it for a, for a bowl of stew. If you read in Hebrews chapter 12, it says Esau sought repentance with tears, but he did not find it. In other words, it's possible to feel very guilty, very bad about having done something wrong. It's possible to have the awareness of wrongdoing. It's possible to even have the associated feeling of guilt with wrongdoing and not repent. Biblically speaking, repentance is much more than just being aware of guilt or feeling bad or guilty. Repentance is actually, has much more to do with the change of direction. Let me say it like this. Here's kind of a working concept. Repentance, according to the Bible, is a change of mind. It's a change of heart, or it's like this, it's, it's to think and, and, and to come to different conclusions. To repent is, is a change of mind, a change of heart, and a change of action. So repenting is to turn from one direction of thought, desire, action to another. Uh, in, in other words, to repent is not just to feel guilty about something, but to repent is to completely reorient yourself in another direction. That's what repentance is. So if you want to see some biblical examples, you want to study it later, look at 2 Kings chapter 5, the story of Naaman, the Syrian commander who had leprosy. He comes and he has this experience where God shows up, he's healed and he is convinced there is no God but the God of Israel. And you see this picture at the end of the story where he comes to Elisha and he says, will God forgive his servant when he goes back and he has to help his king bow at the temple of Dagon? You see this changed life and changed framework and changed activity in the person of Naaman. Are you catching it? Maybe the best example, probably definitely the best example, is in the story of the prodigal son. Where Jesus gives this picture of a son who squanders his wealth. Uh, and if you're wondering who the son is in your world, you are the prodigal son and so am I. You, then Jesus tells the story of the son that goes off and squanders his wealth. And then he has this moment of realization. While he's eating pig slop, he re he's reminded that my father is better than this. And it says, when he came to his senses, he turned and set back for home. That is a picture of repentance. It's to come to your senses, to think differently, but to also change the way that you're going about your life. That's what repenting means. It's a complete change. It's to look at things differently and to walk according to that way. Is this making sense for you? It's very important that we understand this or you're not going to get the central message of Jesus. You're just going to think that it's something to, to, like, to believe or agree with. That's not what repenting is. To repent is a complete reorientation of your world. That's what repenting is. It's to go from believing and acting and living one way to believing and acting and living another way. That's what repentance is. That's why so many of us get caught in the sin cycle at church, those of us who follow Jesus for years. It's possible to come to church to worship and to feel the conviction of the Spirit, putting his finger on something, to actually even say, I'm sorry about that, but not be changed. Why? Because you didn't repent. You just felt bad about it. Repentance is the complete reorientation. That's why often, this is in my notes, but oftentimes if I'm struggling in an area where the Spirit is putting his finger on saying, I have better for you, that's, I'm calling you out of that. I ask God to renew my mind and say, God, help me, help me think differently about that. Why am I going to that? What's, what's at the root of it? Repentance ultimately, very important that we get this, is a complete reorientation of your world. The Scripture shows us that it's possible to feel guilty but not repent. 
Repentance is a total change of orientation. So, why am, I, why am I going to lengths to get you to understand this? Well, when we think about what Jesus means by repent, the kingdom has come near. The first thing you've got to settle is this. When Jesus says repent, he's implying that the ways that you and I are currently thinking and seeking and going about the kingdom of heaven are wrong. How dare you tell me I'm wrong? That's not a popular message today, is it? You go live your truth. You do you. Just follow your heart, man. That's not the words of Jesus. The first thing, the first word that Jesus said in his public ministry, get this, how politically incorrect. Repent. You have to change. You have to change how you think about yourself, how you think about this world, how you think about the kingdom of heaven. You've got to go from this way to that way. It is a call to repentance. That is the central message of Jesus. And he is saying that everything that you are doing to find the king and the kingdom, if it's not connected to him, is the wrong way to do it. You're wrong. You know what? It's a very freeing thing once in a while to just, re just like accept the fact that we, we, we're wrong. Are you thankful that God did not come, Jesus did not come to placate to our false understanding? I'm thankful for a God who's really God, for a king who's really king, who would come and love us enough to say the way that you're doing life is the wrong way. That's not the right way to do life. The, the way that you're going about the kingdom of heaven, that is not the right way. This is not a popular message in our day, is it? We live in a time where you've got to frame the world and shape the world around how you do you. But not according to Jesus. He said, repent, the kingdom is at hand. This is why at the start of the, the text, it says, it, it quotes Isaiah 9. They walk in darkness. They walk in darkness. We have got to understand the central message of Jesus starts with the call to repent, to turn, to reorient your life. Jesus is saying, if you are in search of life, if you are in search of joy, if you are in search of peace, if you are in search of glory, meaning all the things that we would associate with that heavenly standard, if you're in search of that and you are trying to find that in any way other than Jesus himself, you're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong. It's an indictment on all of the false kings and kingdoms and ways that we try to find life. The first thing that Jesus says is he draws a line in the sand and he says, all the other ways that you're trying to find life and joy and peace and meaning and satisfaction and mercy and restitution and restoration, all the other ways, if they don't have my way, if they aren't through me, it's the wrong way. Repent. It's an indictment. But it's also an invitation. It's one sentence. He didn't just say repent and leave us in our guilt, but he offers us something. Let's keep going. Are you with me? I know this is a teaching. You're going to lean in, take notes. This is just stuff you've got to get in your framework. This is going to help you live the life that God has for you. What does he mean by repent the kingdom of heaven? Well, what does Jesus mean by kingdom of heaven? Here's another series of words that you and I will superimpose our Western understanding of what the kingdom means. Those of us who grew up in Canada or the United States or, or Western Europe, you have a different understanding of what kingdom means. And it's critical that we take a minute to understand what a kingdom is. You and I did not really grow up in a kingdom. Yeah, there's the Queen of England, but none of us take that all that seriously. Right? It's like a nod. We just give the queen a nod. You know, watch, watch. There was that series on Netflix, The Crown. Like, ooh. You know, or some of you like follow Harry and Meghan or whatever. But like, we don't live under the reality of a kingdom. We live in a, we live in a democracy. We have elected officials and leaders. And you want to believe that shapes how we understand the kingdom of God. When Jesus comes and says the kingdom. A, a guy named Dr. Miles Monroe has, has some great teaching on the kingdom. And he said this, he said, those of us in the Western world, when we pick up the Bible, the Bible is in danger. 
Now, he doesn't mean it's literally in danger. He means it's in danger because you and I are going to do it wrong. We're going to read it wrong. He says the Bible's in danger because we'll superimpose our Western democratic worldview on it. The kingdom is not a democracy or a republic. It's not. And if we grew up in a communist state, it's not a communist state either. The kingdom is a kingdom. And, and Monroe goes on and he defines a kingdom like this. A kingdom is the governing influence of a king over his territory, impacting it with his will, purpose, and intent, producing a citizenry of his people who reflect his culture and his nature. There is a lot there. But that is what a kingdom is. So when Jesus says the kingdom of heaven, he's referring to a kingdom which is the governing influence of a king over his territory, impacting it with his will, purpose, and intent, producing a people, a citizenry, a citizenry of his people who reflect his culture and nature. So hang with me. So biblically speaking, what is a, what is a kingdom? Let's, let's get some ideas in our head. A kingdom, here's five characteristics of a kingdom. And it's important that you get this in your head so you understand what, where Jesus is coming from. A kingdom, first and foremost, has a king. A king. A singular king. There's not like these kings that share the kingdom. There's one king, and a king has a sovereign hand, a sovereign power over everything. Everything in the kingdom belongs to the king. So if you live in a kingdom... Where there is a king, you live on the king's land, you drink the king's water, you eat the king's food, you breathe the king's air. You go where the king has dictated you can go. The king is the sovereign over everything. I'll tell you what, we struggle with that mentality, don't we? When we think of powers in the West, we think, well, I'll follow you as long as you do a good job. And then I'll vote you out. That's not kingdom. Kingdom is... Everything belongs to the king and you have no say. That's foreign to us, isn't it? Am I just talking to myself? You with me? Like, that's very foreign. Like we, not my king, not my president, right? Don't we do that? Like you just watch like during the Trump presidency, like everyone's like, well, I didn't vote for him, right? Well, a king is your king, whether you like him or not. And the only way to deal with like, if you want to, you either... Obey him or overthrow him. And try to overthrow him at your own risk. But a king is the center point of a kingdom. A kingdom also has a rule. Like there is a governing power that is over a kingdom. A kingdom has a rule. A kingdom also has subjects. People that live, citizens that live within the kingdom. A kingdom also has a place. There is a a land, an area associated with it that where the, the expanse of the authority of the kingdom goes. And finally, a kingdom has a culture. There are ways, traits that we operate within the kingdom. A kingdom has ways, a culture. So, why do we say all that? When Jesus says, repent the kingdom of heaven, he is saying the reality or the dominion of heaven. He's talking about the realm of God, the realm of heaven, with a king, complete with an authority, with a value system, with ways and traits and culture and power and resource, all the things that you would find in a kingdom. This is what Jesus is getting at when he says the kingdom of heaven. It's a kingdom. Now, does that start to confront for some of you the way you think about the gospel and your Christian understanding? Don't we often think about, like, Jesus as my personal Savior who came to meet me and help me deal with the world that I live in? That's not the central message of Jesus. He's talking about a whole reality, a whole kingdom, a whole dominion and domain that exists independent of you. And the invitation is not for you to invite Jesus in so much as it is for Jesus inviting you into his kingdom. Yes, does Jesus want to come and live in your heart? Yes, he does. But it's not like you think. I think, I think over time, we, we have over-individualized the faith. Like me and my personal Savior, where Jesus is my homeboy. He did not come to say, like, uh, let, me, let me move in and be your, like, cosmic butler. No, he's a king with a kingdom. 
And he's talking about a kingdom that you and I need to deal with and turn to. This is what he's saying. Repent the kingdom. Repent the kingdom. The central message of Jesus is way bigger than we think it is. He is opening up a whole new world before us. That the kingdom of God, the kingdom, the dominion of heaven, this is what he's talking about, to think differently. Now, last word, last word. Are you still with me? I know we're doing some real work here. It's just critical that we get this because it's going to start to shape in and bring life to your Christian walk if you understand it in its rightful framework. If you think of Jesus just as your cosmic buddy who came to help you deal with things here and there in your life, you are missing out on the actual reality of the kingdom of God he invites you to live in. All right, so what does he mean by has come near? So Jesus said, repent. You're doing it wrong. The whole kingdom of heaven thing. He says, repent. The kingdom of heaven has come, say it with me, near. Has come near. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Some of your translations, if you're reading like ESV or NASV, uh, it says the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, other translation says, the kingdom of heaven is here. So Jesus is saying, the kingdom of heaven has come near. He is not saying, like some Eastern mysticism, that the kingdom of heaven is everywhere. And we're all really the kingdom. And God is everything and everything is God. It's like midi midichlorians and the force. Any nerds know what I just referenced there? Like, God is not in everything and everywhere, and he's just got to kind of get one with the force. That's not what he's talking about. But also, heaven is not far away. Heaven is not, you know, third star to the right, first dawn till morning. How's that go? Peter Pan, Never Never Land. These, I hope these references are working for you, West or Charlottetown, because they're going right on by here at the valley. So, all oh, good. Good. This is a nerd back there. Got it. <laughs> Heaven is near. Heaven is near. It's close. It's right before you. When Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is near, he's not saying you're in it yet, but it's right in front of you. It's right before you. The door is open, and it's right there for the taking. It's at hand. It's not far away. You don't have to climb the moral ladder. You don't have to build a rocket ship to the stars to try to find heaven. Heaven has come to you. It's near. It's at hand. This is really important that you get this, because a lot of us, when we think about heaven, it's a place that you have to get to. But according to Jesus... Heaven's domain is much more than just that little area wherever in the universe God and his angels are hanging out. He's saying that the dominion of God, the reality and reign of God has actually pressed up right into this world. And that heaven can be experienced right here, right now. Heaven is not far away, it's near. Heaven is not someday, it's now. And heaven is not in some person else other than Jesus, the King. Saying heaven has come near. This is the gospel. The gospel is not, it's not good news that Jesus made a way for us to get to heaven. That we got to climb the moral ladder or be really good people or know all the scriptures or do all these things to try to get to heaven. That is not the gospel. The gospel is that heaven, heaven, not Kevin, Kevin, the gospel is that heaven came to us. That, that the word became flesh, that infinity and transcendence and glory and life and power, the stuff of heaven that our souls know we were made for, that we got to get to and we look for it in substances and sex and relationships and, you know, climbing the corporate ladder and all these things that we hope is going to satisfy the soul that's eluding us and out there somewhere. The gospel is, Jesus says, repent, turn, the kingdom of heaven is right in front of you. Life is right in front of you. Peace is right in front of you. Joy is right in front of you. Meaning, glory, significance is right in front of you. And he's basically saying, here it is. Here I am. Come, repent, the kingdom is near. So, let's start to put it together. I'm going to be done and just, I'm not going to take much longer, but let's put it together. This means 
that all other ways that we try to get to heaven, all the ways that we try to find heaven are the wrong way. The message of Jesus was and is a confrontation against all of the false ways that we try to get heaven. Where, are you, where do you look for heaven? Where do you try to find satisfaction? Where do you try to find joy? Where do you try to find peace, redemption, forgiveness? Where do you look for those things? Jesus is saying, if you are not looking for it and finding it in me, you're doing it wrong. That, so in Jesus' day, I don't think this necessarily will, will, will apply to us, but in Jesus' day, a lot of people had a lot of faith in empire and human progress. And there were a lot of people that were hoping very deeply that Caesar could save them. Or that the might and force of the Roman Empire would develop so much technology and so much societal might that they would be able to extend life forever and ever. And Jesus comes right in the midst of the Roman Empire at the peak of its powers and says, Repent. The kingdom of heaven is not in the Roman Empire. Eternal life, they'll never find it. Repent. Now, I don't think that necessarily applies to our day. There's not a lot of us putting our faith in the science or our faith in political leaders or our faith in human progress. If Elon Musk can just figure out the Neuralink, we're going to be all right. Jesus would say, repent. The kingdom of heaven is not in SpaceX. The kingdom of heaven is not on Instagram. The kingdom of heaven is not in your political leaders. The kingdom of heaven is not in Canada's ability to get policy right. The kingdom of heaven is not that we would develop our natural resources. These things are all fine and good, but the kingdom of heaven is not in that. There were also, and I don't know if this would apply to us at all either, but there were also in Jesus' day a lot of people putting a lot of faith in religion. That if I just follow these moral guidelines and this system of beliefs, and I do these things, and I say these prayers, and I wear these clothes, and I offer these sacrifices, then I can do enough to experience or get to heaven. And Jesus comes right in the heart of Judaism and says, repent. The kingdom of heaven is not in one more sacrifice. Well, it is, but it's in him. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is not found in the temple. Well, it is. It's in us. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is not found through how good you can be. It says, it says in Isaiah, all your righteousness is as filthy rags before me. You'll never be good enough. You'll never do enough good to get to God. The good news is God is good enough to get to you. He says, repent. Heaven is at hand. Let's start to put it all together. Jesus is inviting us. He's inviting us to let me, let me say it like this. Here's, here's what I was looking for. Jesus is inviting us to turn to and trust him, the true king, the good king, in a world full of imposter, failed, tyrant kings and their kingdoms. That's the central message of Jesus. Repent. What you are looking for in your heart of hearts, in the deepest places of your soul, is actually near. It's right before you in the person of Jesus. And then Matthew goes on in the rest of his gospel to show how Jesus opened the door and established the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven and began a work of the gradual overthrow of the powers and principalities of darkness. The gospel is not the story of how Jesus died and, and, and forgave your sins, although that's part of it. The gospel in its macro sense, hear this, is the story of how the true king of the universe came in and reclaimed his crown. From sin, death, powers, principalities, darkness, empire, religion, all of the false kings and kingdoms that we have lived under, the rule and reign of these tyrann tyrannic kingdoms and kings, Jesus came and reclaimed his throne. That is the gospel of the kingdom. And it's so important, church. I know, I know this is a bit of a different sermon. We're deep into the teaching. It's so important that you and, I, you and I understand that Jesus came to establish a kingdom and invite us into it. That Jesus did not come to help you do your kingdom better. 
He came to establish his kingdom. That's why he's not as concerned with Canada, like the government of Canada, as you and I are. Think of how many empires and countries and civilizations God has watched rise and fall. You know what he says to Canada? Repent, the kingdom is near. He says it to America. He says it to Russia. And he says it to the citizens that make up those countries. Repent, the kingdom is near. Jesus is inviting us to trust him, the true king, the good king, in a world full of tyrant, failed, imposter kingdoms. Repent. Turn. Don't look somewhere else. It's here. Don't look in someone else. It's him. Don't look sometime else. It's now. That's the good news. The kingdom has come near through Jesus. He has established his kingdom through the work he did on the cross and resurrection. And he invites us to trust Jesus, to trust him, the true and good king. So let's, let's apply it and wrap up. Let's read uh, Matthew 6 again and see if now this makes a little bit more sense. I did all that work to get to this place, okay? So Jesus, in his great sermon, right at the heart of it, and if you know anything about first century communication, the, we learned this in the Revelation series, the most important thing is in the middle. You know, here in the West, what do we do? We save the most important word for the last word, right? In Jesus' context, the most important word was right in the middle. And right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, this is what Jesus said. Do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear, for the pagans run after these things. So, the pagans, people who are not part of the kingdom, they're running after these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first, what? His kingdom. In his kingdom, he says, and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. In other words, Jesus is saying that all the things that you need, I have. Here's the good news. All the things that you need, God has, and he's willing to give them to you. Jesus is not just able to provide, he wants to provide for you. He's not just able to save and able to protect, he wants to do those things. It's one thing to have a king who's got the capacity, it's another to have the king who's got the desire to help his citizens. Jesus is the true king, but he's also the good king. Who gives his life for his people. How incredible is that? Do not worry. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Here's some quick application. Jesus invites us to return or repent from the kingdom and kings of, here's a few ideas I was thinking, some things that I was thinking that I was being called to repent of this week. To repent from the kingdom of safety and king comfort. How much of our lives are spent trying to just be comfortable and safe? Jesus says, if you seek first the kingdom of God, I can give you a comfort that is eternal. I can give you a security that is eternal. I can give you an assurance that the stock market can't touch, that your bank account can't touch, that illness in your body can't touch. He said earlier, didn't he? How many of you, by worrying, can add one hour to your life? Seek first the kingdom of God, and you will find comfort of the soul that no amount of mansions, no amount of health products, no amount of, you know, feel-good music, no amount of Tony Robbins DVDs, the people that still do DVDs, no amount of those things can help, that can, that can touch. Repent from the kingdom of safety and comfort. That kingdom is filled with anxiety, never at peace, bankrupt of meaning and significance. 
But Jesus says, repent, the kingdom of true significance and glory is at hand. Repent from the kingdom of stuff and King Mammon. We're going to wrap up here. We'll get, bring the keys back. Repent from the kingdom of stuff and King Mammon. What's Mammon? Uh, it's money. It's, it's, if I have this stuff, if I can accumulate this stuff, then I'll be okay. And Jesus would say, repent. The kingdom of heaven is not found in the accumulation of wealth. It's not found in having a better house than your neighbors or a greener lawn. It's not found in your virtue signaling. It's not found in your ability to stack up things that are nice in this world. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Step out of this kingdom plagued by jealousy. I, I have found in this kingdom the culture is jealousy, comparison, never feeling like you have enough, never being satisfied with what you already have. Jesus invites you to step out of that into his kingdom. Repent from the kingdom of man and king progress. Repent from the, the kingdom of man and king progress. Realize, Jesus would say, that human beings are incapable of saving themselves. You are incapable of saving yourself. Jesus would say, give up. Stop trying. Turn to me. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is near. You can step into salvation, true life, true progress, life that will carry on into eternal life. Repent from the kingdom of self and king me. That's a big one right now, isn't it? I did it my way. Jesus would say, don't. Don't. Stop. Don't stay true to yourself. Don't live your truth. Don't find your truth, because it's not true. He would say, repent, the kingdom of heaven. Seek first. If you want to find truth, seek first the kingdom. If you want to find the real you, seek first the kingdom. If you want to find who you really are, seek first the kingdom. If you want to find validation and vindication and hope and peace and joy and meaning, seek first the kingdom. Repent from the kingdom of sin, the devil, and king death. Jesus would tell you today, you do not have to live under the tyranny of sin and darkness. Worried about tomorrow, worried about your health, anxious, wondering when the other shoe is going to fall. You do not have to live under that. Jesus has established an everlasting kingdom. This is what it's talking about in Hebrews. It says, we have been given a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Some of you, if you're, let me say this. I feel this is important for somebody. If your world is shaking, you are not living in the kingdom of heaven. In your heart of hearts, you are serving some other king and that kingdom is shaking. The kingdom of heaven cannot be shaken. So if your life, your soul, your mind lacks stability, if it's plagued with anxiety, I can tell you to the degree that you serve King Jesus is the degree of how unshakable the kingdom and life that you live in is. And so if you're struggling with worry, you're struggling with anxiety, you're worried about this or that, you are living your life not in the reality of King Jesus and his unshakable kingdom. You're living under some other kingdom that can be shaken. Jesus would say, repent, the kingdom is at hand. It's a simple yet world-changing invitation. The king has come. He opens the door for us to experience the fullness of life right here, right now, with the promise of eternal life forever and ever and ever. This is the good news of the gospel of King Jesus. Now, have you thought about it this way? Jesus is bigger than you think he is. He's better than you think he is. His kingdom is more real than you think it is. It's everywhere around you as you open your heart and open your mind, as you completely reorient your life after him, he opens up a whole world to us. Repent. That's a good word. Do you know that? Repent. The kingdom is at hand. I want to pray for us. And I want to pray for two different groups. There's some of you 
that have never actually surrendered your life to King Jesus and said, I'm going to seek you first and trust you for my satisfaction and trust you for my meaning. And I'm going to invite you to do that today. Turn to him and experience the life of heaven. But for most of us here, under the sound of my voice, you need to repent for the millionth time. And that's good. Repentance is a gift. And the Christian life is the ongoing process of turning from false kings and false gospels and false gods and false kingdoms and coming more into grip and alignment with King Jesus and his everlasting kingdom. And maybe some of you have been leaning too far in and you're letting your hope get pulled away by some counterfeit kingdom and king. And Jesus would say, no, just repent. The kingdom is at hand. Jesus is king, cancer is not. Jesus is king, your money is not. Jesus is king, death is not. Jesus is king, your mistakes are not. I'll keep preaching. Jesus is king, those things you're afraid of are not. Jesus is king, demons are not. Jesus is king, your history is not. Jesus is king, your feelings are not. Jesus is king, your friends are not. Jesus is king, your family is not. Jesus is king, Vladimir Putin is not. Jesus is king, Joe Biden is not. Jesus is king, Justin Trudeau is not. Jesus is king, your house is not. If, whether it's a train wreck, or like some, some Mother's Day, Mother's Day, and you're like, I gotta get home and clean my house. Jesus is king, a clean house is not. Jesus is king, your children are not. Jesus is king. Nothing else is. Rest in his kingdom. Father, thank you today for the good news of your kingdom. Lord, help us turn from false kings and their kingdoms who cannot satisfy, who cannot deliver, who cannot change or save. And help us live in the reality of you, King Jesus, and your everlasting, unshakable kingdom. Fill us with the culture, the byproduct, the resource of heaven. Right now, I pray over, over everybody in King's Church under the sound of my voice. As we turn to you, King Jesus, I pray that where there is an abundance of joy in heaven, would you fill us with joy? Where there is an abundance of peace in heaven, would you fill us with peace? Where there is abundance of hope in heaven, fill us with hope. Where there is abundance of health in heaven, fill us with health. Where there is abundance of provision in heaven, fill us with provision today. Lord, help us seek first the kingdom of God and trust that you will add all that we need and then some. And we pray this in Jesus, our King's mighty name, and all God's people said, amen, amen, amen.